السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين أصلي وأسلم على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا وحبيبنا وقرة أعيننا محمد بن عبد الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم ما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في قرآنه العزيز بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والضحى والليل إذا سجى ما ودعك ربك وما قلا ولا الآخرة خير لك من الأولى ولا سوف يعطيك ربك فترضى ألم يجدك يتيما فأوى ووجدك ضالا فهدى ووجدك عائلا فأغنى فأما اليتيم فلا تقهر وأما السائل فلا تنهر وأما بنعمة ربك فحدث all praise and thanks be to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is no doubt our creator, sustainer, nourisher, protector, and curer. We ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his choicest of blessings and salutations upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, his family members, his companions, and all those who tread upon his path with utmost sincerity until the day of Qiyamah. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, just as Harun was asking you all, what is the theme of our conference? Inspired, Jazakumullah khair. So the theme of our conference is inspired. And I want to share with you all an amazing story that should inspire us. More than a millennium ago, there walked a man on this planet who experienced some of the most heartbreaking trials ever known to mankind. And all of this in his one lifetime. This man lost his father, he lost his mother, he lost his grandfather, he, lo he loses his uncle, and then his beloved wife, and then even his little son died in his arms. But in spite of all of the grief and violence that this man experienced, he also made some unparalleled achievements in his lifetime. And despite being brought up only as a shepherd, this man successfully managed a thriving business, educated a society, and touched the hearts of many. There were times when his body was shaken by sorrow, sadness, but those moments did not prevent him, did not, you know, make him waver. They did not prevent him from being a loving husband, a loving father, as well as a caring neighbor until his last days. And he, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, was the greatest optimist to ever walk on the face of this earth, and I'm sure you all know who I'm talking about. Yes? Who? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. You and I, we can all sculpt our own success stories just as this man did, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. All we have to do is follow the manual of life that has been passed down to us in the form of the Quran, as well as the sunnah of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. So during the few minutes that I have with you all, I would like to share three important steps to live a positive life. Three important steps. Number one, we should try to look for an optimistic angle in every situation. Every situation. Because after all, life is all about perception. You know the usual example people use to... Um, um, you know, explain about optimism and pessimism is what the cup full of half water, uh, the, the cup that is uh, half full, the cup of water that is half full. If you were to ask an optimist to describe that cup, he would say the glass is half full. If you were to ask a pessimist to describe that cup, 
he would say the glass is half empty. If you were to ask a feminist to describe that cup, they would say all glasses are equal. A realist would say the glass is half drunk. And an engineer would say the glass isn't big enough. The narcissist would say, wow, look at me in the glass. Maybe I can take a selfie. And you know what the psychologist would say? I wonder how the glass feels about the water. <laughs> or how the water feels about the glass. Either way. So life is all about perception and how we look at things. So number one, we should try to look for an optimistic angle in every situation. You know, just before I came on stage, I posted on Facebook. At times, our biggest mistake is believing that our negative perception of a situation or a matter is the only reality that exists. This is the biggest mistake. We think that that perception of ours is the only way. But no, if you were to look at situations, at matters, carefully, and we'll try to mention a few incidents that took place in the life of the Prophet wasallam. the way he analyzed certain situations, you would come to a conclusion that there are so many options available. It's just that we look at those moments, at those situations in a very, you know, narrow-minded way. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open the doors of goodness for all of us. There are some people from amongst us who are able to see the positives in every situation. Some people. And even when they get knocked down, they manage to get right back up again and they're able to do things with a wonderful spirit. Just like Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Moving on to talk about failure. The American inventor, Thomas Edison, he once said, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. I've not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. In the sense, he failed 10,000 times. But it's all right. I've just found out that, you know, these 10,000 ways won't work. And let's move on to 10,001. This is it. It's a learning process. You learn through your mistakes and your experiences. There was once a uh, shipping company. And they had a, you know, a, a fleet of ships. A huge uh, freight shipping company, all right? They had a fleet of ships, and one of their biggest ships had some engine problems, engine failure. And then they started to look around, go around for engineers to repair this problem. And so many engineers came in, all these you know, big names. They all came in, and they tried to you know, make the, you know, revive the engine, but no one could do it. And uh, this was one of their biggest ships, and it meant a lot. They were losing a lot of money by keeping their ship docked at the harbor. So they started to look high and low, search for a, an engineer, somebody to repair the engine. And someone told them of this old man. He used to be a very good engineer, and generally, you know, he knows his stuff. So they're like, okay, contact the man, get him down somehow. They conta contacted him, and he comes. Simple-looking man with his bag of tools. He comes, shuffles around slowly, and he makes his way to the engine room, the boiler room, wherever it is. And he started to fiddle around with his tools. Now, the owners of the company, they were a bit skeptical the minute they saw the old man. But they thought, okay, he has a good reputation. Perhaps, you know, he, you never know, he might repair it. And they were looking around. He started fiddling around here and there, you know, checking. He was thoroughly checking the engine. Until finally, he goes to his bag. He takes a little hammer, a hammer. And he goes to one point in the engine and taps it. Ooh. It starts to work. Then they were all surprised. The man you know, packed up everything and started to leave. So then they asked him, what about your bill? He said, I'll post you my bill. He goes, a few days pass, and the bill is posted to the company. One of the managers opens up the letter and sees, the bill amounts to $1,000. They were surprised. This man, he just came in. What did he do? He didn't do anything. He just came and tapped. For that, a thousand dollars? Seriously? So they write back to him saying, we need, we require an itemized bill in the sense we want to know why, you know, it's costing a thousand dollars. The man sends another bill. Itemized bill. Tapping with a hammer, two dollars. 
knowing where to tap, $998. So it's a learning process, you know? Life is all about gaining knowledge and experiences. And through experience, you can learn so much, especially through our mistakes, you know? Like they say, your, the best teacher was your last mistake. The best teacher was your last mistake. Because you're going to learn so much. You're not going to, you, go, you, you will obviously tell yourself that I should not make that mistake ever again. Why should I fall into the same pit again? So the best teacher for yourself was your last mistake. And remember, every dark cloud has a silver lining. Every dark cloud has a silver lining. Every tunnel, or else there is always a light at the end of every tunnel. Look at the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We mentioned that, in, in a general sense, he loses all his loved ones, okay? And then his own people, they chase him out of Mecca. And where does he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, go? He goes to Ta'if. Now, do you think this was a random choice to go to Ta'if? You know what? Where shall we go? Let's just go to Ta'if. No. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was a genius. It was strategically decided because Ta'if was close to Mecca. It was a, you know, strategically placed. So it was a wise decision of the Prophet Sallallahu to go to Ta'if and try and convince the people of Ta'if. And look, what happens? He goes to Ta'if, he speaks to the leaders and everybody there, but what happens? They don't take the message. They don't receive him well. They chase him out of Ta'if and they stone him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now this was da'wah, remember. But did he waver? Did he lose hope? He did not. He did not. Right after that, he focused to Medina. Now, you know, a pessimist might think, Medina, so far away. And how are we, if we are to set, set up base in Medina, how are we to even try, of, try and, you know, to think of uh, conquering all these other uh, tribes that are based in Mecca? This is how a pessimist would think. But he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was an optimistic genius. And he thought differently. And we know how the story ends. We know that Makkah was conquered later on. Because of the optimistic nature of the Prophet ﷺ. And at that time, da'wah was so difficult. Allahu Akbar. Look at us. Look at, you know, you and I. Here we are in this beautiful venue. So plush and comfortable. And this is our da'wah. But Rasulullah ﷺ, all alone, Taif. There was no uh, thousand people, two thousand people, three thousand people to welcome him and listen to him. They were not there to, you know, give him a VIP royal treatment and, you know, follow him and, you know, throng around him. But instead, what did they do? They stoned him. They stoned him. But did he waver? He didn't. He didn't. This was the nature of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And like I said at the beginning, if we want to be successful, we have to follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he's reported to have said that plant the tree of love in your heart. إِذَا غُرِسَتْ شَجْرَةُ الْمَحَبَّةِ فِي الْقَلْبِ وَسُقِيَتْ بِمَاءِ الْإِخْلَاسِ وَمُتَابَعَةِ الْحَبِيبِ أَثْمَرَتْ أَنْوَاعَ الثِّمَارِ أتت أكلها كل حين بإذن ربها أصلها ثابت في قرار القلب وفرعها متصل بصدرة المنتهى. If the tree of love, what love are we talking about? Not the love between Layla and Majnun, Romeo and Juliet. The love for Allah and Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. If that tree of love is planted in your heart and if it is watered with the pure waters of ikhlas. الحبيب, and following Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Following the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know what will happen to that tree? It's a metaphor. But it's an amazing concept. That tree will start to bear fruits. Its roots will be firmly embedded in the heart of that individual. And the branches would reach Sidratul Muntaha, the utmost boundary. The boundary where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reached when he went on uh, Isra and Mi'raj, the night journey. So we need to follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We need to derive lessons from his life. 
There are amazing, powerful lessons to be derived from this optimistic genius, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. So like I said, when you think of Medina, a, a pessimist would scoff. But a positive genius like Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, he planned it accordingly. He looked at his options. After Taif, he looked at what other options were available, and then they moved to Medina. This was the nature of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as human beings, we need the positives and negatives that life, throw at, that life throws at us. At times we think that you know, everything needs to be good, everything needs you know, only positive. You're supposed to think positively, but we need negatives in life as well. We need. Look at the story of Khadr, alayhi salatu wasalam. What happened? In, in Surah Al-Kahf, Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, he undertakes a journey to meet Khadr. And they both undertake a sea journey. Okay? And then what does uh, Khadr do? He goes and makes a hole in the ship. He basically scuttles the ship. Musa alayhi salatu wasalam was watching. They said, what, what on earth are you doing? These people were so kind to take us, you know, a boat. And they said they'll drop us on the other side. And you are damaging their ship. And look at it this way. Think of, you know, how the people would have felt, the sailors, when they found out that, oh, there's such a big hole in our ship. But then what did Khadr say later on, alayhi salatu wasalam? What did he say? If I had not scuttled the ship, their ship, if I had not made that small, you know, uh, hole, the ship would have reached the other corner, the other bank, and the ruler would have taken the ship by force. Here, they had to face a small negative in their lives, but at least, you know, they saved their ship. So likewise, we, the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't have access to the bigger picture. It's Allah azza wa jal who has access to the complete picture. All we have are a few pixels in our hands. And at times, with these pixels, we tend to complain. We tend to grumble, whine, question the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let us be pleased with his decree, azza wa jal. Remember, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, at times, what messes us up the most in life is the picture in our head of what our lives are. Are supposed to be. We have got this skewed and negative picture of our own lives in our heads and that's what messes up the way we conduct ourselves. We should look at things from a positive angle. And like I said, we learn from our mistakes at times even more than our success. We learn more from our mistakes. And always remember, whenever, like I said, we need the positives and the negatives, whenever life gives you lemons, what are you supposed to do? Make lemonade. Whenever life gives you lemons, make lemonade. And drink it. Be cool. Don't worry. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not burden a soul more than he or she can endure. Moving on to the second step to bringing in positivity in your life. Number two. What's the first step? Okay. Looks like I woke up everybody up. What's the first step? What? <laughs> All I can hear is Look at everything from a positive angle, right? Try to look at everything from a positive angle. Step number one. Step number two. Render gratitude unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Step number two. On a daily basis. Make it a habit to record gratitude unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a daily basis. You know, we're all caught up in this rat race. We're running from morning to evening. Right? That we tend to forget to render gratitude unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because of that, we tend to lose focus. And we forget the little things that are around us that we enjoy. Just make it a habit to re record gratitude on a daily basis. And then you start to realize the little things as well as the big things around you. The fact that you have clean water to drink. Be like, wow, I have clean water to drink. How many people across the globe don't have that? I have a roof over my head. I have food over my table. I have a loving family waiting for me back at home. I have a loving husband, loving children, loving parents, loving siblings. We have so many blessings that we are, you know, enjoying. Our lives are permeated in the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're supposed to render gratitude. Why? Even the kuffar, they render gratitude. I don't know to whom, but still they do. To bring in a uh, you know, positive aura around them. And we being the slaves of Allah, there is this complete concept of shukr in Islam. 
Allah says, لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ I will give you many fold if you are grateful. And on the other hand, he says, وَلَإِن كَفَرْتُمْ إِنَّ عَذَابِي لَشَدِيدٌ But on the other hand, if you reject my blessings, if you do not render gratitude, indeed, إِنَّ عَذَابِي لَشَدِيدٌ My punishment is severe and painful. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. And by rendering gratitude, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, it helps us to declutter and focus. You know, today, our lives are full of so much of clutter. So much of clutter. Any designers in the house? No designers? Anybody interested in design in the house? No one? Malaysia, seriously? Okay. Okay, do you guys know about minimalistic designs? Yes? That's the in thing now, right? Everybody's going for the minimalistic look in terms of their lives, dressing, lifestyle, design. You've got the clean look. It's just all about a clean background with a nice font. That's about it. All that, you know, vintage designs, uh, gaudy borders, all that's gone now. Why? It's all about simplifying and decluttering. Today, our lives are full of so much of clutter. Our minds are full of clutter. Our brains are full of clutter. <laughs> our news feeds are full of clutter. Why? Because we go around liking all the nonsense that's available on Facebook. And Facebook is confused as to how much it needs to poke into your news feed. You like so many pages now. You need to like what, what you need and what you, know, what you value at the end of the day, what you want to see. Not just whatever. We need to declutter. There's even, you know, people advising on how to declutter your newsfeed to make that the time that you spend on Facebook at least productive rather than scrolling through all unnecessary stuff. And Facebook has brought in some measures as well. I don't want to see this. You can just say, I don't want to see this and swipe it away. And then you'll never see it again or content related to that page. It's all about decluttering. And when you start rendering gratitude unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it helps you declutter your mind. It'll, get, it'll bring focus. You start decluttering your mind because this is valuable real estate, you know, in terms of your mind and your brain. Don't just clutter it up and, you know, fill it up with all sorts of stuff. You should, keep, you should have space to contemplate, to ponder, to reflect. Because sometimes, you know, you read in the Quran, and, you know, it's just so monotonous, you don't feel anything. Why? Because your mind is so occupied. You tie takbir for salah, Allahu Akbar, and you're, you can't concentrate. Why? Because your mind is so occupied. Your mind is so occupied. So we need to declutter. We need to spend time to ponder, reflect, and also contemplate. By rendering gratitude, it's one of the ways that will help to declutter your mind, your life as well. The next thing is to value the little things in life. This comes on, you know, as a gradual process. If you declutter and all of that, you start to value the little things in life. Look at the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was a prophet, alayhi salatu wa salam. The greatest of all prophets, the seal of prophets. He had such a huge responsibility on his shoulders. Such a big mission ahead of him. But yet, he had time to spend with his family. He had time to spend with his children. He had time to do all of that. And he wasn't a person like, you know what, I'm so busy, don't talk to me. No. Look at this instance. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Sahaba and Aisha radiallahu anha, okay? They were all returning from an expedition or they were on their way, you know, on an, on an expedition. Aisha radiallahu anha, being young, she was very playful. She did not understand the gravity of the situation. I mean, you know, we're on an expedition. She runs to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and she says, Ya Rasulullah, you know, I want to run a race with you. I want to run a race with you. Now just think, uh, brothers, if you're in the airport, okay, and you're checking in and you're like really busy in a flurry of things, and your wife comes to you and, honey, I want to run a race. What would you say? Sisters, what do you think your husbands would say? Are you crazy? It's the airport. What's wrong with you? Rasulullah could have said, Aisha, we are on our way on an expedition. This is the time to run around and race around. Let's go back to Medina and we'll race all you want. But you know what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said? He immediately commanded the Sahaba, to all go ahead. And he indulged in that wish of Aisha radiallahu anha. He fulfilled it. He said, okay, fine, let's run. And they ran. And you know who won? 
Aisha radiallahu anha, she won. She won the race. And after they caught up with the other Sahaba, she was going around telling everybody, all the other ladies, you know, amidst the expedition, you know what? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and I, we had a race and I won, I won, I won. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was just listening to this. And who knows, he may have, you know, lost on purpose or maybe he really lost the race. But remember this, he may have lost that race, but he won the race of life. We, on the other hand, we win so many races in terms of arguments between spouses. We want to get the last word in. We want to, you know, yell the most. We do all of that, but we fail the race of life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open the doors of understanding for all of us. I mean. So we value the little things in life. Spend time with our families. Spend time with our spouses, with our children. I think I mentioned it yesterday as well. They need our presence more than our presence. So it's of utmost importance to render gratitude unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now in terms of gratitude, in terms of shukr, there are many forms of shukr. Many forms. Anwa'u shukr. Of which, say for example, ikhlas. We're supposed to do everything sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is one form. Then inculcating taqwa. The fear and the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is basically to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to obey the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to stay away from all that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited. And then husnul dhan, thinking good about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think I mentioned this yesterday as well. The hadith, I didn't mention the hadith, so let me mention it now. Hadith Qudusi, okay? So, do you all know what a hadith Qudusi is? Yes, hands up. MashaAllah. Really good. Hadith Qudsi is basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying something. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is reporting to us. And this is not a, um, from the Quran. It's from the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All right? So this hadith is recorded in the book of Imam al-Bukhari. Abu Huray radiallahu anhu in the rest of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah said, Ana inda ghani abadi bi. I'm according to how my slave thinks of me. And I'm with him when he remembers me. Allahu Akbar. If he remembers me to himself... If my slave remembers me to himself, I remember him to myself. And if he remembers me in a gathering, say if you remember, we're obviously remembering Allah. These gatherings are considered gatherings of dhikr, remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we're talking about Allah, about his beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in that particular hadith, could say that if he remembers me in a gathering, I will remember him in a gathering much better. I.e. the gathering of the angels, Allahu Akbar. And then in that hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hadith Qudusi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if my slave comes to me by a span, by a hand span, I go to him an arm's length. And if he comes to me an arm's length, I go to him two arm's length, outstretched arms basically. Allahu Akbar. And then you know how the hadith ends? If my slave comes to me walking, I will go to him running. Allahu Akbar. This is our beloved maker, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we need to take the initiative. We need to put that foot out. We need to render gratitude. We need to think good about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from the forms of remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is excessive tasbih, subhanallah, excessive tahmeed, alhamdulillah, excessive takbir, Allahu Akbar, you know, saying, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. I remember this story I was reading the other day. I don't know, it's, it's, it's a, um, uh, you know, a fictional story anyway. There was once uh, an imam who sold his horse in the marketplace. And there was this, this is a special thing about this horse, though. There was a buyer who came up and wanted to buy the horse. Uh, but there was a hefty price tag. So the buyer wanted to know, why is this horse so expensive? Is it like an Arabian steed or something like that? The imam said, no, there's something special about this horse. Okay, so what's so special about this horse? Well, he said, uh, the thing is, I used to make so much of the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that um, I trained the horse. When you say subhanallah, the horse trots. Okay? And if you were to say alhamdulillah, the horse gallops really fast. It gallops away. And if you say Allahu Akbar, it hits the brakes. It stops. Subhanallah, it trots. Alhamdulillah, it gallops away. Allahu Akbar, it comes to a halt. Man said, interesting. Okay, I'll buy it. And he, praised, he paid the hefty price and he bought the horse. 
Now he's enjoying the horse because, you know, it's like, you know, like voice commands, yeah? Like Siri on your Apple phone. You say something, it's, it's done. So Siri is dead serious, Siri. So, <laughs> so this man was now enjoying his new ride, this new horse of his. And he thought, let me now, you know, take it out for a ride, take the horse out for a ride. And he said, and he wanted to experiment it. So he said, subhanallah, it started to trot. He said, alhamdulillah, it started to gallop away. He said, Allahu Akbar, it comes to a stop, screeching halt. So he was like really taken up. He thought, let me go for a you know, gallop in the wind. He said, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, he started galloping away. He said, alhamdulillah, so many times that the horse started to gallop so fast, and even he lost track of time, and suddenly he sees that he's headed towards a cliff. A uh, cliff, not a cliff like this, in the sense, a mountain cliff. And then he realizes he panics. And now, you know, he forgets the words and he starts saying, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. The horse also gets confused and the horse keeps running. Until finally it reaches the edge of the cliff. And then he remembers, oh, it's Allahu Akbar to stop. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. He basically screams out in takbir and the horse comes and stops by the edge. The man sighs a relief and uh, sigh, you know sighs of relief and says, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> See, you know, that's just a joke, it's not related to this. <laughs> right? So make excessive takbir, excessive tahmeed, and excessive tasbih. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. Right? Okay, first step, what was it? Look at everything from a positive angle. Second step, I can hear you. Render gratitude, okay. Now the last step, cultivate and live in a positive environment. Cultivate and live in a positive environment. How are you going to do this? Start off by getting rid of the crabs. Who are the crabs? This analogy is based on, if you take a bucket, and if you put a crab, a crab inside it, the crab would come out of the bucket like this. It would come out quickly. But if you were to put two crabs inside, they would never come out. You know why? Each time one crab were to try to come out, the other crab pulls it down. Each time a crab tries to come out, the other crab outstretches its claw and pulls it back in. So get rid of the crabs in your life. You are moving, or we all move with certain individuals who are very negative. You know, maybe from fr our friends, you know, the people we hang out with. Negative. They've got this negative aura around them. Whatever they say is, you know, basically negative statements. Today we live in a world where there's like so much of negativity around us. You feel the negative vibes. We need to really hunt and find for people who are positive and who have this aura of positivity around them. And when you look at them, when you sit by them, when you listen to them, you feel so energized. You feel basically inspired. We need such people and we have to become like them. So for that, we need to first build our own environment. So what if, you know, if all your friends are negative, what you have to do is try to shift the conversation and try to change them. It's all about shifting the, you know, they may start, you know, today it's all about judging one another, criticizing one another, talking bad about one another. And these are the reasons why Islam prohibits gossiping, backbiting. These are all negative things, you know. It doesn't fill an individual with positivity. It fills an individual with negativity. It fills an individual with hate. It doesn't fill an individual with love. If you're positive, you're full of love, kindness, mercy. And this was Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ can you ever think of anything negative from Rasulullah He was such a kind individual. And that's why people flock to him, the Sahaba. Ridwan Ta'ala Ali Majma'in. And that's how he impacted over a billion Muslims all around the world until today. Allahu Akbar. You know? So we need to follow him and, like I said, cultivate and live in a positive environment, starting off by getting rid of the crabs. Because a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity, and an optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. We're supposed to look at the opportunity in every difficulty. If you were to look carefully, if you were to analyze the situation, you would see that it's filled 
at times not just with one, but so many opportunities. But due to us, you know, looking at it from a very narrow angle, we find it um, difficult. So it is upon us that we strive to become individuals who have, who have a positive aura around us. You know, there's one particular incident that took place during the times of our Salaf and al -Saleh. It's mentioned in the books of history. Uh, there was once a man, his name was Abdullah ibn Muhammad. Abdullah ibn Muhammad. He undertook a journey across a particular desert. And he sees a tent in the middle of the desert. And as he was also finding it very difficult, you know, he was feeling very thirsty. He thought, let me go. Perhaps it was someone who's also crossing the desert. And, and had, you know, set up camp. Maybe they, he, they may have some food or water. He goes by the tent only to see that the tent looked deserted. But the flap of the tent was open. He looked inside and he was shocked to see a man who had no feet. He didn't have feet and he seemed to be blind. He seemed to be blind, seated in the middle of the tent. You know, there were pillows around him and he was seated in the middle of the tent. So... Abdullah ibn Muhammad, he enters the tent and he asks, uh, he basically greets the man saying, Assalamu alaikum. And the man says, Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi. Who are you? Then he introduces himself and says, I'm just crossing this, uh, the, the, um, this desert and I saw your tent. So I thought, you know, perhaps you, could ha you would have some water or um, food for me to, you know, refresh myself and then continue my journey. The man says, yes, you'll find something by the table over there. You can help yourself. Now, whilst he was helping himself to water and food, he hears this man praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He hears the man praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillahi ladhi faddalani ala kathir min ibadihi tafdila. He's praising Allah. Praise be to Allah who has favored me over many of his slaves. And he kept on saying this. Now, this man, Abdullah, he was surprised. He was wondering, you know, how has Allah favored this man? He's in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of a desert. He doesn't have feet. He's blind. No one to help him or support him. And he's praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he ate, he drank water, and all the while this man was praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He goes back to him and he asks him, after eating, Ya Sheikh, because he was an old man, can you please tell me you keep remembering Allah, you're keeping on thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But for what? And you're saying that Allah has favored you over his slaves. But how? How has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala favored you? You don't have legs, you're blind, and there's no one to help you or support you. The man, before he replied to that, he said, he asked him a question. Well, don't you think that there are people around the world who cannot speak, who are dumb, who are mute? This man said, yes, of course they are. Then he says, look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me a tongue. I can praise him. I can read the Quran. I can speak. And maybe when someone comes, I can ask them to help me. And they help me. And then he asked the man, asked Abdullah, don't you, don't you think that there are people who are paralyzed and bedridden? They, they don't, you know, their health is in a very bad state. The man said, yes, of course. And this man said, look at me, alhamdulillah, yes, I don't have feet, but I'm healthy. I'm healthy, I'm sitting upright, I have no issues. And then he said to him, don't you think that there are individuals who don't have children? Then this man, Abdullah, said, yes, there are people, whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests, but he doesn't give them children. Then this man, the old man, he says, I have a son who has gone out to look for food. So I have to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. So he went on mentioning little, little blessings until he convinced Abdullah ibn Muhammad who went in in the first place. He convinced him. And then he asked him, okay, now that you have refreshed yourself, can you please do me a favor? Since last evening, my son, he went out to get some food to hunt or whatever it is. And he hasn't returned yet. Can you please go out and see where he is and tell him that I'm waiting for him to come and help me, you know, do my usual chores. Then this man agrees. He goes out looking for this man's son, the old man's son. As he made his way out of the tent and looked around a bit, he saw some vultures circling around a particular area. And why do vultures circle an area? When, you know, there's something, a corpse perhaps or something like that. So this man's fears started to grow. 
But he made his way behind the rock only to find the dead body of the little boy. Now this man, Abdullah, was thinking, how on earth am I to go and break this news to the old man who's already going through so many challenges? And his other worry was, I don't want to break his optimistic attitude. You know, he was racking his mind and brains as to how am I going to do this. Half of him told him, you know what, just, just get on your horse and go. He felt so bad and difficult. But then he felt a responsibility upon him that he should inform the old man because if not, he'll be worried to death thinking about his son. So he makes his way. He drags himself with heavy steps to the tent to inform the, the uh, old man. And he enters the tent. And before informing and before breaking the sad news to him, he asked him, Ya Sheikh, what do you think? You know Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam, yes? The old man said, yes, I know him. Do you know of his story? He said, yes, I know of his story. His story is basically, or rather, he is a synonym to patience. His story is one of patience. Then this man asked him, do you think that you are tested Mo, or was Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam tested Mo? This man said, of course, Ayyub. He was tested the most by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he, lo he lost his wealth, he lost his children, and he was inflicted with a sickness, a disease where people despised going near him. I mean, they hated being near him and they all moved away. Allah has not tested me in such a way. Then this man, Abdullah ibn Muhammad, he told him, I went out looking for your son, but then I found him dead. And it's a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This man was heartbroken, but he did not show it. He started to weep and cry, and he started to say, Alhamdulillah, alladhi faldalani ala kathirin min ibadihi tafdila. And as he was praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he fell to the ground and he passed away. Abdullah ibn Muhammad, he arranged for the burial of this man because there was nobody around. So they buried the man and the child, and he made his way. And once he reached his city, and once he settled home, that night when he slept, he sees a dream. And in that dream, he sees this man, the same man. The books of history mention his name was Abu Qalaba. The same man. He sees him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed him. He had two feet, he could see, and he looked so handsome. He had such a glowing complexion. And Abdullah, he asks the man, how did things fare with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He kept on saying, Alhamdulillah, alladhi faddalani ala kathirin min ibadihi tafdila. All praise be to Allah, who has favored me over many of his slaves. Allahu Akbar. So likewise, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, don't waver. We're all fighting our own battles. And this is why it is of utmost importance that we don't judge anybody. Because at the end of the day, even if you try to judge, all you can do is judge a book by its cover. You can't delve into the secrets of the minds and the hearts. That's something only accessible by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So it is not upon us to judge. He is the best of judges. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Leave the judging to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And rather keep yourself busy striving for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in an optimistic manner following the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all to follow the beautiful sunnah of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. May he azza wa jal make us optimistic. May he help us to look at things from an optimistic angle, just as how Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam did. And, just, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just as how he united us here at the Putrajaya International Convention Center for the past two days. May he unite us in the gardens of Jannah with our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Amin wa akhir da'wai and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. I love you all for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakum Allah khair.